So let's take a look at the second of our um, influences on Parliament, and that's pressure groups. And if you can remember what I said earlier on, AQA in particular, look at three different types of influences. The first is the Law Commission, the second are pressure groups, and the third are the media, or is the media. And I will also add to that political parties, and I'll do a separate video on political parties for you. Um, these three idiots here belong to a group called Fathers for Justice and we'll talk about them later and what it is that they represent and, and what they are trying to achieve. But as we do in every one of these we're going to start by looking at the terms of reference and we're going to look at what we mean by pressure groups and, and, and some of the key important issues that are um, germane to both types. And the first thing to say is that size is not important. They can move from individuals to thousands. So as we'll look at later, um, people like Jamie Oliver can form a pressure group and have done so successfully. And large organisations like um, the Royal Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, the RSPCA, can have tens of thousands of members. So size isn't necessarily important. They can range from very small to very large. The second thing to think about is that they use a variety of methods. So they can go from, you know, very, very peaceful and benign things like petitions right the way up to um, not very nice things like violence. And if we think about it and we consider the economic riots that happened last year, if we consider the uh, violence that occurred on both sides of the argument by the anti and the pro hunt campaigners for hunting with dogs legislation a couple of well, some time ago now but we can get to violence so a variety of methods and the third thing to look at is that they are the most effective pressure groups are the most effective when they have media coverage and particularly media support um, and the sun has been very very powerful and influential in changing some policy and we'll perhaps look at an example of that later the next thing to discuss is to say that there are two main types. The first is something called sectional and sectional pressure groups. An example of a sectional pressure group is the National Union of Teachers. And I've um, remember it's very, very important to use lots and lots of examples in your A-level answers. And the reason for that is it demonstrates assessment area to um, your application, your understanding. So we sectional pressure groups and I would hope that the name almost gives you some clue as to who they represent but an example of that would be the National Union of Teachers. The second type is uh, our cause pressure groups and the example that I've given here are, is Greenpeace and again I'm hoping that the name cause pressure groups sort of gives you an idea about what they represent. And if you like, perhaps another distinction might be sectional prep, pressure groups represent a who and cause pressure groups represent a what generally. Um, and we'll look at that distinction in a moment. But our starting place then is going to be sectional pressure groups. What do we mean by sectional pressure groups? And once again, I've got another example. Straight away, we've got the National Farmers Union, the National Farmers Union. Uh, they represent a section of society. All right, so it seems really obvious, doesn't it? But sectional pressure groups represent a section of society. And what I've done here is I've used the pie chart to represent this section of the pie chart. Um, so what we can say is that, um, in short, they exist to further the interests of a section of society. And professional bodies are good examples of these. Um, let's have a think. We can think of the... Um, British Medical Association, the um, Confederation of British Industry, the um, Rail and Maritime Union, which represents uh, train drivers and people like that, um, the, uh, the Law Society will represent lawyers. So professional bodies are really, so re really good examples. The Law Society, perhaps, um, Confederation of British Industry, National Farmers Union, British Medical Association being good examples of such. And the degree of influence that these people have rely on government support. And there's an interesting link to think about here. If we take, for instance, um, I'll do it on, I'll do this as the left and the right. So if we take, for instance, the Rail and Maritime Union, it's a, a trade union that represents um, train drivers and, well, anybody involved in transport. They are likely to have more success 
they are likely to influence more Labour Party or left-wing politicians. On the other hand, the Confederation of British Industry are likely to represent right-wing organisations or particularly the Conservatives. So the amount of support and the amount of influence that each of these groups have will be dependent on the amount of government support they have for their cause. And that government support will come as a direct result of where on the political spectrum the current government sits. The next thing to say is that um, larger groups are better supported as they represent large a larger section of society. So if we take, for instance, we've already talked about the um, National Union of Teachers, but I'll use them as an example, they have got thousands of members. And thousands of members help them to do two things. Firstly, it makes them wealthier. So large groups are wealthy. And if they are wealthy, they lead to the second thing, which is they carry electoral support. All right, and that's partly because for instance, the Labour Party is funded hugely by the trade unions. The larger the trade union, the more money goes to the Labour Party to help them win the election, the more the Labour Party are likely to listen to those unions, those large unions, when they get into power. So you can see that the larger the larger sectional pressure groups have a larger amount of cash behind them and the more cash they have behind them the more they are going to be listened to. The next thing to say is that they have direct access to MPs. Because their leaders are often on the news, because they are perhaps funding part of the party, um, they have direct access to, to members of parliament and sometimes direct access to ministers. But certainly, if you have a direct route into parliament as a pressure group, it means that you have much greater chance of being heard, much greater chance of being listened to, and much greater chance of uh, perhaps being able to influence politicians to make changes. So, because of wealth and influence, it is rare for governments to introduce a law that affects them without consulting them. Brilliant example of this is the new um, health bill that the current coalition considered uh, introducing when it came to power. Although it claimed it consulted the British Medical Association, it consulted GPs and it consulted nurses, in the end it had to drastically change the proposals uh, because it didn't consult them widely enough and there was absolute uproar and these particular groups of people influenced the public which then influenced Parliament to say that you can't go ahead with this bill in its current format. So failure to recognise and to listen to some of these big pressure groups will mean that you are likely to fail. So there's a very delicate balance to be had between government and between large pressure groups, particularly sectional ones. The next group is a cause pressure group, and it's sort of relatively straightforward, isn't it? Because causes are about ideals and beliefs. So cause pressure groups represent a number of ideals or a particular belief. And in this instance here, I've talked about the RSPCA, which is about animal welfare. We've already mentioned um, Previously, we've got Greenpeace, and Greenpeace represents the um, believes in looking after the environment. Oh, I misspelled that. Looking after the environment. Um, Fathers for Justice, that we've already seen on the on the the opening part of this video, represent or want to um, change the law around child access. And what that means is that fathers who have become divorced are pushing to have a greater degree of child access to their children after divorce. And a favourite of my students, because we live near the coast, is a group called the SES. And that's not the sort of embassy storming gung-ho soldiers. That is uh, surfers against sewage. And they will campaign for clean beaches. They will campaign for the ability for them to surf without um, perhaps some of the sewage that ends up going into our sea. And um, if we think about cause pressure groups, 
they are likely to be much smaller and therefore are likely to have much less influence. Um, this is nothing to do with the pressure group, but I just thought it highlighted the idea well. This is the Tiananmen Square issue. And that doesn't mean to say that they do not or cannot have a great de degree of influence, as we'll see in a moment, individuals, but they are generally smaller, and because they are generally smaller, their influence is much likely to be less. They are less likely to be consulted, and they are less likely to have government links. Partly because they just don't have the access to power that sectional groups do. Although well-publicised groups can have very big impact. And in this instance, we see something called um, Sarah's Law. And the Sun, together with the News of the World, campaigned to change the law around the way in which paedophiles are registered. And parents' right to have access to the names of paedophiles in a particular area. In the United States, that's called Megan's Law, and in this country it's called Sarah's Law. And um, it just demonstrates that if your, your campaign, your individual idea, is published and well publicised, then you can have an impact and you can make changes. And the RSPCA is a good example of this, where the RSPCA um, were able to be consulted and have a huge impact on the Animal Welfare Act um, and that's 2006 and just remember as I said I tell you that oh, I put a line through that's meant to underline it uh, remember what I say you need to have lots of examples to be able to demonstrate to the examiner that you understand um, these key ideas I'm just going to demonstrate how now how influential individuals can be this lady here is a lady called Mary Whitehouse and Mary Whitehouse is a, um, well, if you're as old as me, you'll remember her. She was a campaigner for decency in, in public broadcasting. And what she did is that she wanted to make sure that bad language, nudity, uh, anything that was inappropriate didn't go onto TV at all if she could help it. But when it did go onto TV, it was on a suitable time. So as young people couldn't um, watch that. And because of her... Um, campaign if you like because of her pressure group she had a direct influence on the protection of children act 1978 so as an individual she had a huge amount of influence eventually on the um, on government legislation and this sort of pseudo cockney here we all know as Jamie Oliver is a modern example and Jamie Oliver and this is quite a sort of much longer um, act to write had a direct influence on the education, uh, open brackets, nutritional standards for food, or oh, there should be school food, sorry, for school food, another bracket, England regulations, 2007. So Jamie Oliver, through that campaign that he did for school meals, if you remember, um, was able to have influence on the education, nutritional standards for school food, England regulations 2007. So you can see that individuals can have a huge impact on government policy. The only thing I will say is that both of these individuals also had masses of media support. Oliver, Oliver was famous before the campaign and therefore was able to bring his campaign to talk shows, to TV, and to be a real pain in the bum to, um, to, to the government, which is why the government had to listen to him. Similarly so, Mary Whitehouse became very famous, and when she became famous, just through her own diligence really, the government had to start to listen to her because she began to become very, very publicised. Now, finally, let's just take a look at the um, advantages and disadvantages because that's all that you really need to know for the um, main parts of pressure groups. And I've done the same thing here for you. I've tried to make sure that I've given you a memory aid. And that memory aid is either air for the advantages or pool for the disadvantages. Um, and air being, of course, heir to the throne is how I mean that, H-E-I-R. And uh, here you see a sort of picture of the cheeky chappy, Prince Charles. And um, I've taken H-E-I-R as the start of the main principles. The first is huge membership. Pressure groups can have huge, huge memberships. And by that, I mean that often they are bigger than political parties themselves. 
so they're bigger than the political parties themselves. And where that is the case, what that means is that technically they are able to influence voting hugely. And it would be very foolish, as we've already heard, for parties, governments, not to listen to those. The second area is expertise. If we consider something like the RSPCA, they will have a number of vets, animal welfare experts, all paid employed either as members or as part of the main organisation. It would be very foolish for a government to take on some form of animal welfare legislation without consulting that expertise. And because they have that expertise, it makes them quite influential and powerful. So they, have huge mem they can have huge memberships and they can have huge amounts of expertise. The third thing is that they increase parliamentary awareness. And what that means is that frequently Parliament is often removed from the lives of real people and real parts of society. And what pressure groups can help to do is they can help to raise that um, or raise Parliament's awareness. And I'll go back to the old surfers against sewage. Um, if you are a, a, a member of Parliament in Westminster, you may not very you may not be aware of perhaps some um, particularly bad sewage issues in and around our local coastlines in particular localised areas and therefore what pressure groups can do is to help to make sure that Parliament know in this instance um, in and around the, the Clacton area that there is an issue with sewage and therefore that needs to be dealt with. And the fourth key advantage is it helps to raise public awareness. Here I've put in an example of Movember and um, Movember is a charity where men are uh, suggested, men are uh, um, asked to grow moustaches for the month of November to raise awareness for both testicular and prostate cancer. And um, the charity has been, the pressure group has been very, very successful in helping to raise public awareness about that particular issue. So let's just have a look. Those are the advantages of course four of them I'll just run over them again huge membership expertise increased parliamentary awareness and raise public awareness and finally let's just look at the disadvantages and I've used the acronym POOL P-O-O-L the first is that they hold passionately held they, they have passionately held views um, and because of that that can sometimes lead and I'll put it dodgy tactics down what I mean by that is that if we look at, for instance, the Hunting with Dogs Act, both the pro-hunt and the anti-hunt campaigners both were guilty of using um, violence and some very underhand tactics to try to beat their opponents. And partly that is driven by the fact that they hold such, they have such passion. And that's not to say that passion is wrong, but what it is to say is that sometimes people can become so passionate that they forget to act rationally and in a way that society might like them to do. Um, and they get frustrated and therefore that passion can lead to perhaps some, some tactics that we wouldn't want and that certainly that doesn't help Parliament and doesn't help the group and doesn't help society generally. A disadvantage is that they are also one-sided, or they can be one-sided. The very nature of a pressure group means that you want to change the law to suit you. So for instance, let's take Fathers for Justice. Fathers for Justice are incredibly biased about their right to have child access. And that bias might mean that they don't listen. I'm not saying this is true, but it might mean that they don't listen to all sides of the argument and a much broader picture. The same would be true of any pressure group. Take the National Union of Teachers, they will be very biased towards protecting the rights of teachers, probably above and beyond any other um, issue and argument. And therefore you have to call into question, if you like, the, the objective nature of some of these pressure groups. The third thing is that they often hold the opinions of small sections of society. Now, if it's the RSPCA, they have thousands of members. But if you consider there are just short of 60 million people in this country, in order for, to, for any pressure group to represent the majority, they would have to have 30 million members. There are very few that do that. So most of them, by their very nature, represent a smaller section of society and a smaller section of society's opinions. 
But let's take the surfers against sewage again. They are going to be numbering nothing more than perhaps just the thousands. And when we compare thousands of people against a population of 60 million, you can see that those opinions are very small when we compare them against how many people are in the country. And lastly, there are some outsider groups, some pressure groups who have no contact with Parliament and therefore they have limited say. So they have limited say in what happens. Um, only those really that have a, a large amount of pressure and influence on Parliament and on government actually end up able to change the law. So we have passionately held views which lead to dodgy tactics, the one-sided biased nature of most of these pressure groups, the opinions of a small section rather than the majority and they do have little contact with Parliament. So those are pressure groups and um, I will just sum up by saying if you have an exam question the easiest way to cover it is to look at the terms of reference the numbers, what they are, define them quickly, the fact that they have a variety of methods and they need media to be effective, then to look at both cause and sectional and then detail what a sectional pressure group with lots of examples and then a cause pressure group with lots of examples um, and that will be more than enough. Well I hope that's been um, or made your studies easier and uh, I look forward to talking to you in the next video.